Welcome to Stand. This is where we make courage become contagious, helping you stand for freedom, truth, and government by the people. I'm Kelly Chewbacca, your host, a former government watchdog and candidate for U.S. Senate. I'm joined today by my wonderful co-host and son, Josiah Chewbacca. So happy to have you with me. This is our show on standshow.org is where you can follow us. Please hit subscribe. We'd love to have you become one of our awesome standouts. That's where you can find all of our podcast episodes. Follow us on social media. Check out our YouTube channel. Everything you want is there, standshow.org. Today, I'm so happy to have with us Barbara Richter. She's an amazing author, a ghostwriter, an entrepreneur, and the founder of DIYbook.us. That's DIYbook.us for do-it-yourself book. And she's also the host of a podcast called Writing for Immortality. She's been doing this professional writing for 20 years, and so we're so excited to have her talk with us today about the boldness and courage it takes to be a business owner and the freedom that comes with literacy, writing, and taking the stand for yourself. Barbara, thanks so much for being with us. We're so happy to have you today. Thank you for the beautiful introduction, Kelly. It's amazing to be here and with your wonderful audience. Yeah, we're, we're very happy to have you. I have so many questions to ask you. I'm really inspired by what you've done in being an entrepreneur and writing. I'm inspired by how you help other people turn their memories into memoirs. I think that's fascinating. And one of the things I want to really talk to you, though, is um, the difference in the dichotomy between legacy and literacy. We have a massive issue in America right now I'm super concerned about where only 40% of our current youth are considered literate, and literate being where they're functional in society, where they can reach their potential, where they're even able to to get a job that re- requires any level of reading. Um, that's really concerning. So when you, when you look at the numbers, there was a study that came out that less than 75% of Americans can read past, um, um, sorry, 75% of Americans read below a sixth grade level. And so when it, yeah. I love that, that you are helping people write books, and I want to talk about that. But one of the things that concerns me is when we think about what led to things like the civil rights movement or the freedom for slaves in America, what has led to freedom for an independence and democracy for countries around the world, so much of it ties to literacy. And I know that reading and literacy has been such an important part of your background. I wanted to just get some of your thoughts on the decline of literacy in America. Well, it's, I think we could have multiple episodes on this topic, so I'll, I'll try to do what I can in the time that we have. It's a, um, it's a, it's a big issue, and actually, some of my ghostwriting clients, we, we have one of the issues that um, some of them have worked on is improving literacy rates in the United States. It's multifaceted. Some of it is, you know, it has to do with the K through twelve system. It has to do with what's happening at home. There's a lot of issues. Um, so what, what, you know, here I am, I'm trying to get people to write and it's hard enough when people are having a hard time reading. Um, what I would say is that a lot of this happens, you know, it starts at home. If you can get people at home reading with their family, with somebody that they trust or that they love, it almost doesn't even matter what, um, you'll get a spark, you get this feeling of ownership, and that can lead you to so many different things in life. Um, but you're right, this is just such a huge issue. I mean, I don't even know where to begin with it. But once you do have the ability to read, once wherever your level is, and when you can increase your level to something more advanced, the world opens up to you. And I think that's something that gets lost with, I just don't know if people are talking about it, that when you can read and you can comprehend, your your brain is doing things, your brain is getting stronger, and you, you're better equipped to deal with what's going on in the world around you. Yeah, that's right. There's a great freedom in literacy. It's something I think that was really lost during COVID. I know that you, you your generation when you were in high school is really shut down because of the lockdowns and COVID and, and kids were just really lost. It seemed like two years of just like a literacy setback as they uh, didn't have those prompts at school and weren't forced to do reading at home. How did you get into being such a avid reader and writer, where did this passion of yours come from? Oh, I think if I had done anything other than working with books, it would have been strange. I grew up in a house full of books. <laughs> My father uh, is a nonfiction author. He's working on book number 11 right now. And growing up, he was a journalist and he was a book editor. So every day felt like Christmas because we would be getting review books. They would be coming in and they were books that were coming out on 
you know, children's books, cookbooks, adult books, everything. We had access to it all. So it was a free for all. And there were really very few constraints on what we were picking up out of the boxes. If my dad was not reviewing it, we could take it. And so that's really where it started. And there were just books everywhere. And um, you can't really see behind me, but um, in the rest of the house, I've continued the tradition. There's books in the bathroom, there's books in the kitchen. They're just, they're everywhere. So you really can't go someplace without picking one up. So that's really where it started. And I've continued with it. Um, so uh, I read forever. I've been writing forever. And I've been really, um, I guess, blessed because my daughter has also picked up this this bug. And I, I will say during COVID, unfortunately, the schools did shut down, but she was okay because she just got to go and sit and read her books in her room. And I, I ran out of books to give her, so uh, which I, I feel very fortunate to be able to say I was in that position. Uh, one thing I want to say is that you, you cited that study about kids um, during COVID who lost their um, their reading levels. I did see another study recently that also found that kids were able to bounce back, but it also depended on the kind of system that they were in, if the, the school systems that they were in were also prepared to help them bounce back. So Kids are, are flexible. If you can give them the resources and, and the scaffolding that they need, they can rise to the occasion. That's interesting, Barbara. What school systems were more helpful for kids bouncing back with literacy? Um, schools that had robust English programs, that had early intervention programs, mm -hmm. um, you know, things that you would expect. Oh, that's super interesting. So let's talk a little bit about what it's like being a woman who's an entrepreneur and business owner. So you've been in your, in your own business writing, you know, for 20 years, you've launched DIYbook.us, where you not only help with ghostwriting, but you help people with really easy process for being able to prompt people in the writing process. I really believe anybody can write a book. It's actually the discipline that's hard. It's almost like a weight loss program. Anyone can lose weight. It's just, it's micro decisions over time, right? And writing mm -hmm. a book is really similar. But if you don't have a coach, you don't have someone in the gym helping you, you don't have a weight loss program. And, and you're kind of like that. You're like a, uh, a boot camp instructor or a, a gym instructor. You're your gym trainer for book writing, which is amazing. <laughs> but it must have been really hard saying, you know, this is a an idea that I have. Um, no one else really doing that, you know, helping someone with that concept with an online, um, an online process for helping somebody write a book. I'd love for you to talk to the audience because there might be other um, budding entrepreneurs listening in, people who want to write a story or they have an idea, they don't know where to start. How did you, how did you decide I'm going to start a business and I'm going to persevere in this? What are some of those challenges you've had to overcome? Um, well, I have to, I guess, back up a little bit before I launched my ghostwriting company, I actually used to be a teacher. So I guess deep down in my heart, I always want to help people, whether they're learning you know, French lit in that case, or if they're writing a book, I, I want to help. So my ghostwriting company, um, with ghostwriting, it's an intense, you know, uh, relationship. It's, I, I call it like a nine month marriage. <laughs> um, but it's also, it can be an expensive undertaking for a lot mm -hmm. of people. And what I found for every uh, client that would work with me with ghostwriting, I would probably turn away a dozen mm -hmm. who, who had wonderful stories, had great things to say, but they couldn't, they couldn't uh, afford working with me. And that, um, that really made me sad. So I said, well, how can I help people actually write their stories in a way that's affordable and in a way where they're not going to get scammed? Because uh, unfortunately, in, in the ghostwriting world, if you go online, you can type in ghostwriting services and you'll see people who will write a whole book for you for, you know, 500 bucks. And they also, by the way, they wrote like The Cat in the Hat and Little House on the Prairie. And by the way, all of these companies, they all wrote the exact same book. So they wouldn't be out there if they people weren't using those services. So that really got me upset too, that people were getting taken advantage by these other companies. So I said, well, how can I do that? And, and I had to basically disassemble the ghostwriting and writing process, but also make it accessible for people um, who may be intimidated by writing for various reasons. You know, maybe their English teacher in high school was not very nice to them or not very caring. Um, or they just, you know, people uh, feel intimidated just in general. You see people who've written, you know, hundreds of pages uh, for a book and you say, how am I going to do that? And so we just really stripped it away and made it a process where people can go at their own pace. I provide a pacing. So I guess kind of like a coach in a gym, I'm encouraging um, the writer to go uh, once a week. We send out email prompts based on a series of uh, genres that the customer picks out uh, when they sign up. 
Uh, but they don't have to follow them because the beauty about writing like a life story is that it's personal to yourself. So if you want to write about your your military history, if you want to write about your your faith journey, if you want to just write about your family or adversity, any of those things, you can choose those and you can write them when you want, when you feel like you can. And the nice thing about the prompts um, that we give is they're based on my experience with ghostwriting clients who have covered all these different topics anyway. So I try to be as hands-on as possible without me actually being there helping them. And that's been really rewarding um, to hear people say, I've been wanting to write this book, kind of like you said earlier, um, but I've been intimidated by it. Or I've been, uh, I've heard the term analysis paralysis. I've just overthought it. Um, and then when they get in there, they're not necessarily following the prompts. They're going and they're doing their own thing, which I think is just very beautiful. Yeah, that's really wonderful. I went on to pick up on the other side of our break on DIY book. And so for audience, DIYbook.us is where you can find Barbara Richter in this process. She's talking about some of the services that you offer, but specifically, I'd like us to talk about uh, why this is important. So it's not just people out there thinking, oh, you know, I want to write a book, but why is it important for people to take the time to write, to capture their stories and capture these memories, uh, what that process is about. And for people who might not be as literate as someone who grew up around books and had their dad as an editor and journalist, uh, what can they do to overcome maybe some of those reservations or insecurities they have? Like, I might not be that great of a writer. So what are some of the answers for that? So we'll pick up on the other side of this break with Barbara Richter at DIYbook.us. I'm Kelly Chewbacca with my son, Josiah Chewbacca. You're with us on Stand. We'll see you on the other side of the break. Make sure to hit up standshow.org and hit subscribe. We'll see you in just a minute. Welcome back to Stand. We're here with Barbara Richter. She is the founder of DIYbook.us, a ghostwriting service allowing you to write your own books with the help of professional writers who can really help you bring your stories to life. She specializes in personal memoirs. Barbara, before the break, we were talking a lot about how, I believe you said something along the lines of just get people to start reading. We were talking about literacy rates in our children and how if we just get people to start reading, they will move that forward and it will come alive on its own. One of my concerns with that is I often see younger people, third, fourth graders, picking up books like Diary of a Wimpy Kid or Big Nate. They pick up a lot of these, as my mom would say, junk books. And that's well and good because it's something that they like and they enjoy and it gets them reading and I'm all for that. But then they continue to read these books through sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, And I think that that's where we see a lot of our literacy rates drop off. So what are your thoughts on that? I think of it like a a, a balanced diet. Um, So I think there is a place for those kinds of books, especially if you're working with reluctant readers. Um, If if you can kind of get them, if that's the way that they're going to get their their carrots, I guess, um, get them with those books that perhaps uh, they're reading. You know, I think of that scene in the League of Their Own where one of the characters, well, she's reading, all right, it's okay. And it's like a romance novel. <laughs> um, so you start there, but also you you do need um, uh, adults to say, all right, you've worked on this one. Let's find something else. Um, I, I think if you just let kids kind of go and pick their own thing, of course, I mean, it's like with food. Are you going to pick your your salad? Or are you going to pick your chocolate? I know where I'm going to go. Um, and, and to make it enjoyable though, I I think that's another thing is that there's this tendency to say, well, if it's not Diary of a Wimpy Kid, I'm not going to read it. Um, so that's a shift in perspective. And I, I remember back when I used to be a teacher, you, you you have to sell it. (laughs) If if you're excited about it, your, your students are going to be excited about it. So I I think that's something that uh, educators and, and of course, parents, because it does start at home. I mean, parents, and, and I know parents can be intimidated too, if they're not, um, confident readers. Um, They may be growing with their children. And I think being honest about that is okay. I mean, kids, we can be, I know when I used to teach sometimes, and I taught middle school, so every day was different. And and it can be, you know, the kids can be your toughest critics. But I think they do appreciate when you speak to them and say, look, we're going to go on this journey together. We're both going to find books. We're both going to read something that um, just brings us joy. And then we're going to challenge ourselves a little bit. I think another issue is going from maybe like Dire of a Wimpy Kid to um, you know, something by Ernest Hemingway, you know, that's a huge leap and that's super intimidating. And then people will say, well, I'm never going to read again. Um, so, uh, having professionals, you know, having educators, having librarians who you can go to and say, this is where I'm at. 
help me. Uh, I, I think all of that can go towards uh, creating a, a better literacy amongst uh, our children and our adults as well. That's a really great response. Thank you. It's something that I've seen kind of happening with my younger siblings as well. And I've tried to think through, you know, where was it for me in my own personal reader's journey where I moved away from that easier content into that harder content. And for me, it was reading a lot of fantasy books because I was really into fiction as a kid. And so it was a pretty mm -hmm. easy jump to go from the Chronicles of Narnia to some big, thick book that's ridiculously big because that's what I was into. So what I hear you saying is it's about mm -hmm. finding what people are interested in and just using that to grow their education, but not in a way that limits their future potential. Right. And, and that takes time. It's not automatic and kids aren't going to know it on their own necessarily. Yeah. So Barbara, I want to ask you, um, why, in your opinion, is it important for people to write? So you've started this company to help this um, people do it themselves. So do it yourself book .us, DIY book .us, to help people write down their own stories. But usually as someone's going to make the bold step of kind of staking their entire income on starting a business they have a really compelling why and you know simon senek wrote this amazing book start with why what's mm -hmm. the big why behind this why would you say to all the people listening why is it important to write your how-to book or to capture your expertise um, to write down the passion that you have or to tell uh, your life story to pass on you know, Josiah has talked about, you know, the fantasy books he wrote. So to write down the fantasy book in his heart, what's the why behind that? What would you pass on to our audience? The why, there's two whys. Uh, one, at a very basic level, writing is good for your brain. So even if you're just writing for yourself, it actually stimulates uh, the neurons' neuroplasticity. So you're getting smarter just by writing something, no matter what it is. But on a larger level, if you're writing, if you're an entrepreneur and you're writing a book, when you write a book, you become the authority in your field. Uh, it's something permanent. You're giving it to people. You're saying, I spent time, I sat down and I, I'm sharing my knowledge with you. So that's one reason. If you're writing a life story, no one else has lived your life story. No one else will know unless you put it on a, you know, in a book and you share it with them. Um, I know for families, uh, I hear sometimes, I wish I had done this sooner. I wish I had done this when, you know, my, this family member was here. Um, because it, when it's written down, you're preserving it for future generations that you may or may not meet. And um, one thing that I think is also pretty important is we have all of these wonderful technological advancements. Um, but I know over the last 20 years, we've gone from, or even 30 years, you go from CDs, you go from different types of saving formats on your computer, you go from one computer to another. You can lose files, you can lose photos. Um, who knows what we're gonna be using 10 to 15 years from now. Um, but a book, uh, bound, hardcover or paperback, um, that's going to be pretty hard to replace in terms of technology. I mean, there's just a couple things that might uh, affect it, you know, like wind, rain, fire, those sorts of things. Um, but you, you can be pretty much assured that your words will last when they're bound in a book. Hmm. Yeah. I, I would actually challenge you on that. And this is something that I'd want to get your take on because something I see sure. a lot in our society is we're starting to ban books. We're starting to censor books. We're starting to take out classics like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn because of offensive content and material. And so unfortunately in America today, you know, you can write down your words, but if somebody finds them offensive, they might not actually stand the test of time and your ideas might not actually be shared with other people. So from your perspective as both a writer and an educator, hmm. what is the impact of banning books and limiting other people's words in education? Boy, um, I mean, I think banning books is just a, it's a tough, I, I, I don't like the idea. I think if there's a book there that you don't want to read, you don't have to read it. <laughs> um, there's lots of other books out there. Um, there was a, I, I, I blanking on the group, but there was a community um, in the United States where they were thinking of banning books and actually what they did, I think it might've been in one of the Carolinas and they brought the community together and what they decided to do was they were going to read the books that were on the docket to be banned. And it was a range of things. I mean, it was, I, I can't remember all the books, but across the spectrum of books that have been in the news recently and of the dozen or so books that they had planned to ban, I think ultimately 
they they chose one or two. Um, so so right there, I think sometimes a lot of the stuff we just gets caught up in this this fervor, and I just wish people would actually maybe go and, and read the books and then think about them and think about what they're trying to achieve with this act. Um, uh, I hope that this is just a, a, a moment in time and that we will stop doing this and we will go back to just having the books out there. And if you choose to read it, cool. If not, there's others out there for you. It's a, so I'm hopeful. <laughs> I'm hopeful, Josiah. It, there's an interesting intersection in what you're talking about, that the that words influence people. They change minds. They change hearts. They they shape legacies. And without those words, they, they don't. And I was reading the study that showed that 25% of Americans have not read or listened to a book in this past year. And so, wow. yes, so... What to your point, Josiah? Not only are we banning books, but we do have an option of just self-limiting input, right? That you can self-ban books by simply opting out and just choosing to not be influenced or not be educated. But the way you get educated—I mean, our entire university and academic system is simply based on the idea that we're going to expose you to X amount of different authors and writers and journal articles. It will inform you of different opinions. It will help to shape your own. You craft a response, and then you get a degree. And Mm -hmm. that essentially happens in two, three, or four years, uh, conferring different levels of degrees. But it's basically how many different forms of writing can we expose you to in that amount of time for you to synthesize? And, you know, you hear all these arguments about, well, you could just do that at home. Like, why, why are you going to an institution? And I think there is some value in being exposed to the students in the classroom. But all of that to say, um, this all comes up against this concept of free speech and the First Amendment and the value of speech and ideas and this marketplace of ideas that we were fundamentally founded on as a country that is so Mm -hmm. valuable. And and to your point, Barbara, um, there used to be this idea that if somebody said something a little bit bizarre at a birthday party or the backyard barbecue or the cocktail party, everybody would just say, that's just a weird thing to say. And society was sort of self-select out of weird things. And mm-hmm. and the people who wanted to hear weird things would hear it, but the rest of us would just mm-hmm. not read that book, right? And then- Right, or move on. Or move on, right. And then the ideas that were influential and powerful would rise to the top, which is, you know, essentially what we learned in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, these long debates that went on across the country and everybody heard them and then we sided with one guy and built a monument and the other guy most people don't remember. You get the idea. And so there, right. there is value in writing and conveying ideas to shape hearts and influence minds in order to, um, as you said, pass on expertise, uh, share ideas, share lessons learned so other people don't have to learn them the hard way, um, shape mm-hmm. and craft legacies. I love this idea of turning your memories into memoirs as so people can learn. I know one thing that we're going through right now is uh, – my husband's father, who grew up in Democratic Republic of the Congo, he has crafted his memories into memoirs and learning some of wow, the things wonderful. he's gone through, being uh, raised and living and surviving through coups and dictators. And um, it's just so fascinating and such a great legacy to pass on to our children. So for everybody listening, if this is tugging at your hearts and you're thinking, you know what, I'm inspired. I think that I could do this. Barbara's services are at DIYbook.us. We're transitioning to a break. Barbara, thank you so much for being with us. You're on Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. And today my co-host is Josiah Chewbacca. You can find us on standshow.org. We'll see you right after this break. Stand by. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. I'm Kelly Chewbacca, and today my co-host is Josiah Chewbacca. We just finished an awesome interview with Barbara Richter, who is the founder of DIYbook.us, talking about all things freedom of speech, the importance of writing, and literacy rates in America. Josiah, you are one of our affected youth. You're still in the public school system in America, affected by literacy rates in America. And here in Alaska, our literacy rate across the state is well below 30%. I'm not sure what the exact number is. I just know it's been dropping uh, significantly in these last several years. In some parts of our state, I think our literacy rate is at 10% in some of our communities. And so uh, this is something that directly affects us. And one of the questions we were talking about is um, not only how do you get people to write when they can't even read? 
And as you know, literacy affects things like your ability to get a job, your ability to function in society, but also affects things like freedom. There's high literacy rates correlated to things like imprisonment and things like economic freedom, um, not only in the United States, but across the world. I wanted to just get a sense from you. What do you see having been in school? I mean, we're even graduating kids, not just in Alaska, but across America who are not literate, who don't have, I'm not talking about sixth grade literacy. I'm talking about even less than that. So do not have functional literacy for, for America, independence for America, um, being able to function, being able to reach their full potential. What are some of your reflections as somebody who's currently in the school system on literacy rates for students in America? The absolute most important thing is early reading and early learning, particularly before third grade. So hearing about this mass illiteracy epidemic spreading through Alaska is extremely concerning to me because I just learned that 60% of our students in at least Anchorage in kindergarten through third grade are well below, not just below, but well below the average, the national average, not necessarily even proficiency, but the national average for reading literacy. But once we get beyond third grade, our students start to catch up. So our fourth through 12th graders aren't as far behind. Most of them are along the national average of reading rates, but we still produce mass illiteracy throughout our states, which tells me that even though our fourth through 12th graders are in fact at the national average standard for their reading, so many of them have been so negatively impacted in their early education and their early reading development that it continues to produce mass illiteracy into adulthood. So targeting that kindergarten through third grade time, anyone below eight years old, and seriously focusing on reading literacy, proficiency, and even excellency in that time period is absolutely crucial to having a literate society. I think that's a really great point. One of the things that I've been focusing on is early intervention tools, making sure that we have the tools needed. We can't always count on parents or a stable home environment to really be pushing reading or excited about reading, um, being able to run to the library or get resources for reading. And so we really need to be able to equip our schools to have early intervention resources that work, that give good data, that give good support to the teachers, to the students, and then to whoever is taking care of the kids back at home in order to push early intervention so that they can target, they can see what's the gap, what's the need, and then how do we target it with resources to make sure that the kids have what they need in order to close that gap. And I think you're right that targeting it between pre-K and third grade is really the area that we need to focus on. And I really believe this has been a debate across America, what about funding for schools, funding for education, that funding does not need to go into more administration, more overhead, more uh, people at the top. It does not need to go into more buildings and more uh, sports yards. It does. It needs to go into these intervention programs. It needs to go into teachers who are performing, who we actually produce metrics so that we're actually putting money towards results. Because continuing to just fund a system and fund a a um, organization metric, if you will, that actually is just producing illiteracy doesn't work. Uh, as we know, government will always grow. The education system is part of government. Government will always grow. It will always consume resources. And unless its feet are held to the fire, it will not produce results. And we really need to focus on this, on producing literacy as a result, producing, I would say, a love for reading mm -hmm. as a result so that our kids actually have the skills and the strengths that they need in order to contribute to that marketplace of ideas, reach their full potential, be functioning in society, be equipped for the workplace so that we can have a strong America and a prosperous America in the future. Otherwise, we will produce class after class after class, and then ultimately a generation of non-readers. And how will those generations, you know, we talk about America's greatest generation. How will those generations of illiterate Americans even compete against China and Russia and these, these countries that obviously are adversarial to us and undermining us every chance they get, let alone countries that are right next door to us, like Mexico, that are, are competing with us in trade right now and competing with us even at the border. Yeah, absolutely. So I one of the things I was going to bring up is you said 
instilling a love of reading in children, getting not everyone has the opportunity to run to the library. And the thought that that put into my mind is, you know, the library here in Anchorage isn't safe. Like, yes. If I were a father, I would never let my child go to that library. We don't go to the library. We don't go to the library. It's and become a homeless. Readers. It's become a place filled shelter. with illiterate people. And so as right. we continue to produce a society of illiterate Americans, this next generation of illiterate Americans is going to feed into that vicious cycle of making an unsafe, unproductive society in which reading is not accessible to the majority of people, furthering the problem even more. So something to note there, this is a vicious cycle. Illiteracy is not like literacy. Literacy does not self-reproduce. It doesn't That's replicate. a great point. Literacy does not just happen. No. Illiteracy does, in fact, it's contagious. It's cancerous. It replicates yes. on its own. The other thing that I would touch on is talking about education funding and how throwing money at the problem doesn't necessarily fix it. There's a very classic American saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I would kind of reverse that saying and apply it to funding and education. If it's still broken, don't act like it's fixed. You can throw money at a system that's working. If a system is working and in well order and producing results, and then you throw money at it, you're going to see an exponential explosion of production and success and excellence in your students in that system. If the system is broken and you throw money at it, you're just throwing your money out the window. So while I absolutely support increases in education funding, it needs to come into a fixed system that is already producing results with the resources that it has. That's a really great point. It's the, a basic investment principle. You don't throw bad money after bad money. If your investment isn't producing results, you don't say, well, maybe if I up my investment, this one will do better. You end up changing your investment manager or reallocate your portfolio. And that's fundamentally what needs to happen as someone who has spent her career as a government watchdog, you actually can make changes in government without changing the money. You, you, you change the system, you change the process, you change the people, you change how funds are currently allocated in order to drive mission and results before you say, okay, now we're going to put more money into this in order to pump up the results. But right now, we have to ask, what are we funding? Because what we're funding fundamentally is illiteracy. Exactly. If you're funding a system that is not producing results you want to see, why would you even put money in that? Why are you choosing to produce results that you then say you don't want to see? That's right. Something I think is encouraging is we do have models across the country. Just like Barbara was saying, there are schools that have actually succeeded and done this well, not only in fixing the pre-K to, th to third grade intervention and literacy challenge, but, fi but fixing it pre-K to twelve. And we have great models of school systems. They're not just in private schools. And as a side note, we've had not so great experiences in private school. And we've had some really great experiences in public school. So whether it's public school or charter school or homeschool or private school, because we've done them all in our family, um, there are great school systems that can be modeled across the country for whoever is listening to this, because this show is broadcast nationally, that we can model our school systems after and we can say, you know, we don't have to create this from scratch. We can look at who's done it before. There are plenty of people who've walked this path ahead of us and figured this out. Uh, reading didn't start in this century. Reading... <laughs> Reading has been going on for a while, and people have figured the, figured out the tools for literacy a while ago, and we can model after what they've done and then improve on it for our culture, our context, and our communities and figure out what works best for us, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel in order to make this thing, to make this thing work. So I would recommend that we look at these best practices and implement what works instead of trying to figure out something from scratch or, as you say, continue to invest in systems that aren't working. Right. And I think it's especially crucial with where we see America at today. One of the things that they try to teach us so often in college courses, especially anything pertaining to reading or writing or English in college courses, is media literacy, critical thinking, analyzing a source, validating its credibility, being able to spot bias, being able to spot fake news. And if you can't even read, how mm. can you think through truth? How can you reason, is this person lying to me? Is this a valid, how can you rationalize or apply logic to any argument? How can you lead a world nation, a superpower? How can you influence, impact, or take a stand on anything in America if you cannot even 
read and understand basic ideas and what kind of a government that is supposed to be for its people would do such a disservice to its citizens as to cripple them from birth in such an important Mm. way. But yeah, by perpetuating illiteracy, it really leaves us open to indoctrination and disinformation and someone telling you what to think instead of how to think, which really disempowers the people. It's a great point. Let's pick that up on the other side of this break. You're listening to Stand with Kelly Nikki Chewbacca, and today my host is Josiah Chewbacca. I'd love for you to hit subscribe at standshow.org. You can find all of our podcasts and all of our previous episodes. Thanks for being a standout. We'll see you in a minute. Stand by. Welcome back to Stand. You're on Stand with Kelly Nikki Chewbacca. I'm your co-host today, Josiah Chewbacca, here with my wonderful mother, Kelly Chewbacca. And we're going to talk about Dune. Dune is one of my favorite book series of all times. And I was super excited, as you know, when the Dune 2 movie came out. I saw it twice, as you know, in theaters. And I was disappointed, to say the least, unfortunately, because I'm a fan of the series. I'm a fan of the novels, right? And so when I see certain characters portrayed in certain ways that weren't up to my perceptions or my imagination of those characters, it it's personal for me. You know, it's, <laughs> I was going to say, it actually was a good movie. Tell me why you're so, so disappointed. <laughs> so I will, I, I will be totally candid. They're, they're good movies. If you're watching them as their own stories, they're good movies. My issue with it is it wasn't my story. It wasn't, it wasn't the Dune that I read. It wasn't the Dune that I had built in my mind. And I think that really portrays the importance of writing. So I was sitting there and for our audience who doesn't know, I have ADHD. So I'm sitting there with my ADHD brain and just ripping into this when I should be working on literally anything else. But I'm just sitting there with my thoughts, right? And I am contemplating the impact of writing and the adaptations of books into movies, right? And I was really also looking at The Hunger Games because I read The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and I loved it. It was a phenomenal book, one of the greatest books I've ever read. And the movie didn't... The movie was a great movie, but it didn't live up to the The movie was not the book. It was not the book. Why is that? Why do we get so disappointed when adaptations don't fit our Mm. reality? So I was thinking through this, and it really occurred to me that when you you write, when someone writes a book, they're writing an idea. They're portraying an idea, an image, a character, a picture, imagination. When you read that writing, you're not actually reading you are writing in your mind an interpretation of that person's mental image right so i can read dune and you can read dune and it could say paul atreides is a young skinny 15 year old male with curly black hair and you and i could envision two completely different looking individuals yeah two totally different characters in our mind exactly because we wrote out different ideas based on the prompt given to us. So when you read a book, you're actually writing ideas in your mind and writing things into your imagination. When you watch a movie, you are reading someone else's adaptation. Mm. You're reading what someone else wrote in their mind. You're now visualizing someone else's imagination or what they wrote and imprinted in their imagination. Exactly. You are reading someone else's thought writing, Mm -hmm. so to speak, and you are thereby losing your ability to write your own imagination, to write your own thoughts, to build your own Dune. So for all the people who haven't read the Dune novels, every single one of you enjoyed those, the the, the Dune movies. Right, I liked it. I didn't read the book. I was like, cool movie. You have never read it. You enjoyed it, as you should. They're great movies. They're great stories on their own. But for those of us who have written our own thoughts about dune it is a completely different experience Mm -hmm. and i think that really encapsulates the importance of writing that's a really good point what i hear you saying is the nobody can capture your thoughts your mind your imagination and your unique contributions so for those who don't know uh, dune sets 
is set in on other planets. And so what I hear you saying is everybody who's read the Dune novels has created other galaxies in their mind. And then yeah. when when you re- watch these movies, your transport is like being in Star Trek. You're like, wait a minute, that that it, this isn't what the planet looks like. These aren't what the characters look like because you ha- have created your own worlds in your mind. And that's really what writing is, mm-hmm. is you're creating your own worlds in your mind. You're, you're creating your own ability to contribute to conversations, to contribute to really to humanity, mm-hmm. ideas and concepts and stories and life and memories and experiences that really can shape people's minds and um, ideas and how we interact and how we learn and what happens as a, as a collective society. But if you don't contribute, then we lose your particular individual contribution and nobody can make your individual unique contribution. That's what you're saying, right? right. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I would just to kind of outline for our audience my thinking and thought process here, because some people might say, well, you're, you're just reading someone else's book. You're not actually writing anything. So let's look at writing as the grandfather. Writing is you coming up with the original source and you are the, you're the origin, you're the founder and the starter of that source. That's an extremely powerful place to be because the ideas that are flowing from you are completely natural. Mm. Those have a lot of power to influence. When you are reading, you're writing someone else's ideas in your mind, but that doesn't leave you susceptible to them. When you write someone else's ideas in your mind, you can write in your own things. And that's why we have conversations and debates. That's why we analyze arguments is because we now take these source inputs and we kind of like how AI would generate a text prompt. We receive just a little bit and then we build so much more on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so building up that muscle, that ability to analyze ideas, analyze things that other people create and then build upon that and expand upon that, bring your own thoughts, ideas, and values into that, and then also share that with others is so crucial, especially in a country like America where free speech and public forum are fundamental and crucial to our country's success and prosperity. Yeah, I really like that. I think writing is really important. I wanna go back to this idea that you asked during our interview about banning books. So there are these ideas that are being banned right now because they're socially unpopular. It's this witch hunt culture that has been perpetuated as like a a cancel culture. If we decide that we have social fear about an idea, we're going to shut it down. So Dr. Seuss books have been canceled, Uh, Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer, other what we would consider mainstream books that once were taught in elementary school, there's other ones that are on the list. But then there's other books that are actually really concerning to society. Like I would say books that really advocate for and groom children for pedophilia that are, you know, are being, are being banned. Is there a line? Where should that line be? I think uh, one, one place that I would say is a really good line to advocate where we stop from Um, You know, as we've seen in some really authoritarian cultures, piles of books in a burn in a burn pile so that we can all um, align with the authoritarian government in charge that doesn't like ideas that challenge it, which is terrifying because this is our First Amendment. But where do we draw that line with things that like really push pedophilia is there is a place where those ideas can be like in um, certain X rated or adult bookstores where you can go in if you want. But we don't put those books in, say, the public library where we have in the kids section, the under 18 section of the public library or in our school libraries where we have kids because we don't want children exposed to ideas that would be considered dangerous for their health. There's a compelling interest in protecting children and their innocence. Um, What would you say to that as someone who's been involved in those discussions from a student leader perspective? I would... First of all, thank you for bringing up the burning of the books occurring in Nazi Germany. I was Something, being really careful about not accusing a single government because multiple governments can engage in that. Multiple governments have done that, but the most prolific example that I can think of in history Absolutely. is Nazi Germany. And what I would really add on to that and warn us to be careful of is such widespread censorship of it. Something that I find interesting is I've looked through a lot of lists of books that people propose should be banned, and I don't think I've ever seen Mein Kampf on the list of books that we should be banned. Right? Like, have you ever have you ever heard anyone talk about banning Mein Kampf? 
So Dr. Seuss, but not Hitler. That's Doctors, fascinating. Isn't that so interesting? So clearly the issue is not with the ideas that are being portrayed. And we, we touched on that in our interview today. This whole episode has kind of been about, you know, we should not restrict anyone's ability or rights to create content and share it with others. If you want to seek out that content, if you want to expose your child to that content, you can do that. Let that happen. I would go to, I forgot which Supreme Court justice said it, but he defined obscenity as, I know it when I see it. So when we talk about what should or should not be allowed in a third grade classroom, I know, I know what should or should not be allowed in books in a third grade classroom when I see it. So I think we don't need as a society to totally throw these books out the window, burn them, ban them. We also don't need to allow just anything to be accessible to anyone. There's certain content that absolutely should be restricted to only people who are willingly, intentionally seeking that knowledge. You know, it's a really good point. We do this with movies. Exactly. Movies have certain ratings. You can't and, come see this if you're under 18. Right. Yeah. Nor nor do you have the authority to just access it like at, on, on pay-per-view at home. Right. You have to put in codes and stuff in order mm -hmm. to access certain rated movies. It's a good mm -hmm. point. And I think our society is doing a really great job with that. I think so, so many cities, states, counties have started these book advisory boards where just like we talked about in our interview today, the community actually comes together, reads the books, and then decides, okay, what should we what or should we level? not have mm -hmm. it? So I think a solution would be something along those lines. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll know obscenity when we see it. Let's not be overly political. Let's all come to the table with all the books that we are concerned about being in kindergarten, first, second, third grade classrooms, all the books we are considering banning, and let's read through them and then decide as a community, okay, what contains pedophilia and should not be allowed? What contains dangerous I've, I've advanced seen. political thought that should be reserved for people who hmm. can like any any radicalizing material should be reserved for someone older who has constructed the ability to analyze abstract thought let's sit down decide as a community okay here's what we like here's what needs to be restricted but not removed it's a great idea thanks josiah standing for free speech Freedom, Truth, Government by the People. This is Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. Today, my co-host is Josiah Chewbacca. You can find us on standshow.org where you can hit subscribe on any of our podcast platforms or on YouTube and Rumble. Become one of our standouts. We'll see you next week on standshow.org.